Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Radio Free Mormon, how are you? I'm great. Bill Rio, how are you tonight? Life is good, my friend. Uh, what's new and exciting? Well, what's new and exciting is that uh, last week, when you made a special point of announcing all the podcasts that are going under the Mormon Discussions umbrella, you made <laughs> oh. a notable omission. I, I mean, I was just off. glad you got me in there, but yeah, apparently I... you missed somebody. Is that right? It's a long list at this point. I think there are 10 current podcasts that are running under the Mormon Discussion Incorporated umbrella, and we're about to add a number 11 sometime in the next week or two. Wow. And, and it's, I think people will be quite pleased with that one as well. But I forgot, Scott, I am so sorry, Rami Umptum, Ruminations, uh, hosted by Scott Dyer. And I did mention him this morning when I was interviewed by 21st Century Saints. Okay, okay. So we want to make sure that everybody does know that there is a very, very excellent podcast going on called Rami Umptum Ruminations. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah, it does well. Yes, and I'll be interviewed over at Rami Umptum Ruminations. Boy, try and say that three times fast. This Friday morning. Now, it's not going to be live, but I'll be interviewed this Friday morning, and then we'll get it up both at Rami Umptum Ruminations as well as at Radio Free Mormon. Yeah. And if folks would you want to catch that interview I did this morning with 21st Century Saints, go on to YouTube, type in 21ST Century Saints. Uh, it'll come up. It should be their most current uh, video up there. Uh, they're doing a great job, by the way. Hit the like or subscribe button on them and uh, help them get a few more followers because I think they're doing great work over there, too. You got a fancy shirt on tonight, Bill. Oh, look at this. I even got matching glasses, brother. Look at that. That's amazing. Are you going to go bowling after the show? That's that's what I was joking my wife about. These are bowling shirts, you know? That's what they look like. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to start calling you Jesus. I wore my shredded jeans and my bowling shirt out today in public. Is it Jesus or Jesus? I can't remember. It's Joshua Bar Yosef. Joshua Bar Yosef. Oh, I was doing a big Lebowski reference. <laughs> okay. I thought we were talking about Jesus of Nazareth here on Mormonism Live. Oh, no. This was Jesus of somewhere south of the border, I think. <laughs> that's Jesus then. <laughs> Well, anyway, we've got a very, very uh, exceptional show tonight, and it deals with the subject of the role of women in the church. And, you know, all you have to do is say that one expression, and everybody who's been a member of the church for more than five minutes knows exactly what it is you're talking about. That's how pervasive this role of women is in the church, as it has been taught by the church for many, many decades now, and even continues into the present believe it or not. And what we have for the show tonight is a lady who is a member of the church. Her name is Nicole Thorpe, and she's active in the church, but she's encountering some difficulties with her testimony. I think it's fair to say that. I'll let her speak for herself here in a second, but just by way of thumbnail description, that um, her disenchantment, ongoing disenchantment with the church is, I think, closely linked to the issue of the role of women in the church. And I don't want to say too much about it more than that. I want to give her the chance to tell her story so I don't do any spoilers. But is she is she in the green room, Bill? Let's bring her up. Hi. There she is, Nicole Thorpe. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't want you to be nervous at all. Just try and all pretend right. that thousands of people aren't watching you right now. <laughs> because right. really, thousands of people are not watching you right now. It's only hundreds. <laughs> Now, yeah. it'll be thousands in the coming days. All it right. will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and you've got a great background there. I do. Look, Look at you that. Do. You've got the some Avengers. Marvel Comics posters. Yes. My husband is a big comic book fan. He has been has a comic book YouTube channel. So this is his background I'm using today. How do I not know about this? <laughs> Dr. T Comics. I'll give him a shout out. Really? Dr. T Comics. Is yeah. that CS or X? 
uh, CS. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great. And you catch me the one night I'm not wearing a Marvel Comics T-shirt. I'm wearing <laughs> what is it? It's Karate Kid. Oh, he Cobra Kai. Strike first, strike Big hard. Fans. Yeah. No mercy. <laughs> Big fans. Well, Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about your story tonight? Um, I understand that you are married and that you've got four beautiful children. And I'm not just saying that idly because I actually saw the pictures. And they are gorgeous kids. They are. It's amazing. Yeah, Uh, thank you. So go ahead. All right. Um, I was raised in Davis County, Utah. Like very orthodox family. um, Very happy home. Lovely childhood. Um. And my, I, my parents who were members of the church. Yes. Yes. Very active. Pioneers going back both generations. Yes. So you had the ideal yes, Mormon active. child life. Yes. It was absolutely the prescribed, you know, framework for a Mormon family. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I went to high school and everything in Bountiful, Utah and graduated. I went to the University of Utah and then served a mission. I served a mission in Toronto, Canada, and so you got went to the married. University. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting all You're over good. the place. I'm famous for it. I apologize. <laughs> when you went to the University of Utah, did you graduate before you went on your mission or just do a year or something? I did not. I did a couple of years and then I left. Mm-hmm. What were you studying? Siblings. Uh, I have a degree in vocal performance. So oh, great. I sing classical music. What yeah. lesser minds are called singing. Yes. Voice class. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So you say, see, what kind of, you say classical singing, are you talking about opera yeah, like and arias? Opera. And, mm-hmm. Well, fantastic. Opera, oratorio, yes. Really? I'm not going to get ask you to, to sing anything for us, <laughs> although I'm tempted. What's your favorite opera? I love Lucia di Lamamur, and I am also really a sad cliche, and I love La Boheme by Puccini. I love almost anything by Puccini. Oh, so. well, that's wonderful. You know, yeah. I, have to, I hate to admit it, but my favorite opera is the one I don't have to go to. <laughs> Isn't that fair. terrible? That's fair. That's terrible. But I won't I, even throw out an uncultured, you know. Reference. I am so lowbrow. <laughs> it's amazing. But honestly, what, the way I under, the way I express it and the way I think it truly is, is that I am not able, it's my own deficiency that I am not able to appreciate opera. Of course, I haven't really I tried. Fair. Yeah. Because I think that, that obviously massively uh, talented people yes. in opera, it's like yes. an Olympic event. The most event. talented, absolutely. Yes. It is definitely the Olympics of singing. So sure. we've got we've had some pictures, and can we go back? Uh, Maven is behind the screen, the scene. She'll be out in front of the scenes here. There. <laughs> All Maven, right. How so are you doing? Want to go back to um, the family picture, or can we? We had one with Nicole and her brothers and sisters. Yes, I am the oldest of six children. And there you are on the right. Yeah, there I am. And so these are your brothers and sisters. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're the oldest? I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's wonderful. What a great looking group. And then you went and got married? Yep, I served a mission. I got married. Oh, I'm sorry. We almost skipped your mission and we don't want to do that. Where did you serve your right. mission? It was called Toronto, Canada. Toronto, Canada. Yeah. There that she is. A is. Picture of me freezing. That is really, I can <laughs> Toronto, see how Canada. cold it is. Freezing for the Lord in Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> in Toronto, right. where many are cold, but few are frozen. <laughs> <laughs> that I got that. A- seminary. That's, like, that's a seminary teacher joke. I was going to say, you didn't just make that up on the spot, did you? No, this is what we call the missionaries who got called to Sapporo. In Japan, Oof. where many are cold, but few are frozen. So anyway, <laughs> uh, it's been kicking around for quite a while, that line. So there you are proving that your faithfulness. Why did you go on a mission, by the way? There's a certain, mm, is there still a stigma? There used to be when I went on a mission back in 79 on women who went on missions. Yes. So I went on a mission just a few years before the age change And one of the biggest reasons I served a mission, my motivation was that I was watching all of my male counterparts go on missions. They were so praised. It was like missionary worship. It was, these young men are going to do something so important. Mm -hmm. And I felt like anything I was doing in comparison just wasn't quite as important. Mm -hmm. And that was a big driving force for me to serve a mission. 
But what about getting married? That would have been more important. (laughs) Wouldn't it? I think it was like one moment for me of just like sticking it to the system because I did meet my husband before I went on my mission, but not until after I had a mission call. And I did have a few people who counseled that if I had a young man I was interested in and wanted to marry, that I should not be serving a mission, even though I already had a mission call. So even though you already had it. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Anytime is a good time to get married. Like, if the day before that's you right. go, you that's right. You get a free pass if you're female. To, for yes, it was also expressed to me on my mission that if at any point I wanted to leave my mission and go home and get married, that was okay as well. Are you? Who's telling you this? Is this the Holy <laughs> Ghost or something more substantial? No. <laughs> Is this your mission real, president? Real life people. Uh, yeah, mission leaders, um, just church leaders before I left. And part of that was because my husband was, his plan was to wait for me. He waited for me while I was on my mission, which is a fun role reversal as well. I'm sure, because he was already back from his, then I I take it. Yes, yes. I was also counseled to, you know, put him in my heart and lock it up. Oh, the old locked heart thing. <laughs> lock your yeah. heart. That's yes. even in the intro to, an, to another podcast, I think. Absolutely. The Sunstone Mormon History Podcast. <laughs> Lock your heart. hearts. Yep. Lindsay yes. says that every time they, they have an episode. <laughs> so that. you're off there, but you're actually being told, hey, look, this is not that important. Being married is more important. But nevertheless, you stayed on your mission. Is that correct? I did. Mm-hmm. Okay. I did. And why was that again? You said something about that will be willing to wait because there's so many who I knew absolutely would not. If if, if, even if they loved a girl, if if, you know, like wanted to propose or said, "I I would, I want you to stay," Um, it's just a really long time. And in Mormon years, it's a really, really long time. That's true. Yeah, I had someone ask me not to go on a mission, but it wasn't. We weren't in a relationship. It was a like, let's see if we could work this out, and. um, We had to have a difficult conversation where even even if I didn't go on a mission, like, the second we're not going to talk this out. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I did, like I, so he. I don't know if he would have waited if I. Uh, but I don't think so. I, I don't think if I said I'm going to go anyway. I, he. I think you would have been done with me at that point. Oh, I had some people ask me not to go on my mission, but those were mostly investigators in Japan. <laughs> post, Seriously, post folks. Missionary service. Uh, but a bum. <laughs> are quite the commodity in Japan and I can only imagine when you went th- th- even more so that what's a commodity <laughs> for another day maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I'm sorry because I'm so interested in your story that yeah, uh, I'm that. impeding your telling of it so go ahead oh um one more thing I will say about my mission and is that it was a good experience, but it was also very apparent to me that I was operating as a woman within a framework that was designed by men for men. And so I think when I talk to men about their mission experiences, it's just very (laughs) different. And I don't know if it's more similar now that the age has changed, but it was like we were serving completely different missions on completely different planets. So yeah, and then I came home from my mission and we got married very quickly after that because we were we had already waited so an eternity. I was. Look at me checking all the boxes, right? Yes. Performing my Mormonism very well. Uh, we got married and we were married about a year and a half. I was finishing school. Uh, we were married about a year and a half before I uh, got pregnant with our first and I was pregnant with him at my graduation. So I did graduate. I do have my degree. I completed my degree. In vocal performance? Um, Yes. And a BA degree or an MFA degree? It is a BA degree. um, With a major? And yeah, but anyone who has that degree in vocal performance knows that if you want a career, Mm -hmm. you must have a master's degree. Right. But I knew that wasn't I knew that wasn't in the cards for me. Why wasn't it in the cards for you? <laughs> because, Is it something you wanted to do? Um, it was a master's degree was something I was interested in. My actual degree, it was very apparent to me about halfway through that I didn't want a career as an opera singer. 
but I was halfway through to my degree. I would get married and be a stay at home mother anyway. So I could use this degree to, you know, work on a talent and also teach voice lessons from my home when I had kids. It was a very practical thing. My really the thing I, had thought about doing if I weren't going to get married was get a master's degree in social work and be a clinically licensed social worker and be a therapist. But I didn't do that. I graduated with my degree and I started having children. I had four children between 2011 and 2017. And none of them are twins. Nope. There they are. Oh, there they are. I love this picture. (laughs) They're beautiful. They're beautiful children. And they should be on the cover of catalogs everywhere. I agree. Let's get You can make a lot of money off those kids. I'm just saying. (laughs) I know. It's a cash. You should ponderize them. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I just love that picture. Merchandise. This is just the 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 most beautiful, lovely family. And if I were going to say Mormon, I'll throw it in there too. This is the most beautiful, lovely Mormon family. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we had these children. We had them quickly. My husband was teaching choir. He was also a music major. And so he was a choir teacher at a high school. Mm -hmm. And we had always planned that he would teach for a few years and then Um, get a master's degree. And also we would go on to get a doctoral degree so that he could teach. We are going to get a doctoral degree. Whose name is going to be on that doctoral degree that we are going to get? He was going to do that. Oh, okay. Okay. I just wanted to to do that. that. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that you wanted to get a master's degree, but that has to be put in abeyance while you're the mother having the children, raising the children. And supporting your husband while he goes on to get his master's degree. Right. Which was all very much a part of my upbringing and not really even my upbringing. It's not like my parents made up the things they were teaching us or that my young women leaders were just pulling stuff out of the air to teach us. These were things that prophets and apostles had prescribed. And I was fully invested in that, fully invested. So I had no problem with the plan really at all. Can we take just a couple of seconds here, Nicole, if it's all right, to -hmm. interrupt your story, just to buttress what it is you said about the messaging coming from leaders of the church. For anybody who's been under a rock for the past (laughs) 50 years, uh, we're going to just do a few quotes and a few clips from leaders of the church going back to 1987 with a very special fireside that was given by the president of the church. Nobody gets to say, oh, he wasn't president of the church. He wasn't the prophet. He, he doesn't speak with authority or any of that other kind of stuff. This is Ezra Taft Benson, 1987, as president of the church, giving a special fireside, which was titled To the Mothers so, in Zion. Yes. Before Bill puts that up, I just wanted to say we're, we have a couple of other quotes to go through first. Um, ah, sorry, that okay? No, that's not okay. Yeah, so we're going to get into the, the uh, I guess, the messaging now, or did you want to, or did you want Nicole to kind of wrap up to where she is at right now? She talked, she, she had mentioned the messaging, and so I just mm-hmm. thought we would go ahead and use that as okay. an intro to that and then come back to her yeah. story, if that's okay. Yes. By the way, everybody, Maven has been working overtime, collecting quotes, putting together uh, this wonderful outline, uh, and I looked up a couple things, but it's been nothing compared to what Maven's done. So maybe I should just go with what you're saying, except I won't because patriarchy. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole in this stack right here. Because we are taking orders from men on the women's roles in the church podcast episode today. Yeah, right. exactly. Thank you. Thank right. you. I just <laughs> thought that would be okay. Is that okay with you? It is okay. <laughs> okay. That looks okay. like reluctance. It's really timing, like good timing because. Um, I uh, just even over the weekend, I was was thinking about this very thing and wanting to try to find some of the resources of this kind of messaging. And Nicole, you had said kind of something similar that um, people don't always get how thorough it is. And so, yes, I I was actually going to like um, the Savers uh, bookstores around here, just try like trying to get some of this stuff back. I mean, I partly for myself, I think, but also just like. I guess just to prove, like, it really is, like, a lot of messaging, you know? Yes, I've had, 
I've had people tell me that the reason I feel the way I do about being a woman in the church is because of the way I was raised. These are other members of the church. And I think, oh. I no, you don't feel this way because you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> this like, is the gaslighting that we do to each other. Yes, I paid attention. I read conference talks daily as a, you know, a teenager. I was very invested. We were very orthodox. My parents taught us the words of the prophets and none of it was stuff they had just made up themselves. I know we encounter this in Mormon apologetics all the time when we're encountering apologists who are saying, oh, well, the church has taught about Joseph Smith uh, dictating the Book of Mormon out of a hat. Uh, for I, I learned this when I was a kid in seminary is what you'll hear. This kind of gaslighting in order to right. try and make it sound right. less patriarchal than it is. Right. Or to invalidate the experiences of other members of the church who are having yes. the wrong experiences. Right. So here we so, have so something. A, I guess a few main, um, I guess, categories about the indoctrination as far as the role of of women goes and motherhood. So the first is just that it's not just our own family, but we're, the society at large, this is how important it is. Um, and so this is from the, the family proclamation. We warned that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. And that's just one of many quotes to this degree that this like society itself falls apart at the seams if mothers aren't in the homes. So it isn't just our own families, but literally like the nation is riding on our backs. So there's this. No pressure. Uh, right. No pressure. Right. Um, and it's always so vague to just like the disintegrate, like what is, even is the disintegration of the family? If we're not talking about like kicking out LGBT kids, you know, and things like that. If that's not it, you know, it's something else. Um, but this one's from Gordon B. Hinckley. Nicole, do you want to read this one? This was um, one that you brought up. Sure. Women who make a house a home make a far greater contribution to society than those who command large armies or stand at the head of impressive corporations. Isn't go. that amazing coming from a man who's standing at the head of an impressive corporation? <laughs> right. And I think this is twofold because this isn't just about like trying to make us feel that it, it is society that's on our backs with this, but also I think kind of trying to elevate it to something that we clearly know that it, it isn't, you know? Yeah. So that's, this is one like area of indoctrination that just the, um, again, that, that this is society depends on us. Um, the second element is where I'll bring in, uh, we can bring in Ezra Taft Benson. So yeah, as soon as Bill pulls it up, it'll start playing. Um, so you can go ahead and pull it up anytime. This, or, is a two, this is a two minute clip out of a, a 40 minute long talk. Might have been and the longer whole than talk minutes. is toxic. A steaming pile wow. of garbage. It's my number one, like most hated talk now. I remember <laughs> I sent you the clip and you, and you responded viscerally. Oh, I was texting you. Yeah. Like uh, throughout the whole thing. <laughs> I sent you several texts before I even got to this clip. With the but, little vomiting <laughs> emojis. Yes. Okay. Here it is, guys. Now, my dear mothers, knowing of your divine role to bear and rear children and bring them back to him, how will you accomplish this in the Lord's way? I say the Lord's way because it is a different, it is different from the world's way. The Lord clearly defined the roles of mothers and fathers in providing for the rearing of righteous posterity. In the beginning, Adam, not Eve, was instructed to earn their bread by the sweat of his brow. Contrary to conventional wisdom, a mother's calling is in the home not in the marketplace. Again, in the Doctrine and Covenants, we read, quote, women have claim on their husbands for their maintenance until their husbands are taken. This is the divine right of a wife and mother 
She cares for and nourishes her children at home. Her husband earns the living for the family, which makes this nourishing possible. With that chain claim on their husbands for their financial support, the counsel of the church has always been for mothers to spend their full time in the home rearing and caring for children. Does he even know his name in that one? You're, you're muted, RFM. Yes, of course he knows <laughs> his name in that one. He just s choose the teleprompter. He likes to go directly from the written words. So uh, this is 87. Gonna... This is two years after Spencer Kimball passed away. It it just sounds like he's reading at like a third grade level, just, you know, like he was like following along and trying to stay with it. it I don't know. I, I just knew he had dementia towards the end of his life. And, yeah. and, yeah. and I know they were still throwing him up in front of the teleprompter, kind of like President Monson. Yeah, I think this is really <laughs> when he was more early on. And I think that uh, he's he's pretty much compass mentis there. <laughs> okay, well, whatever yeah. that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, because this was it part of a pamphlet? I, I do think that this is something that was written by him. Oh, I think yeah, so too. Sure. And, and he says, this has always been the teaching of the church and in large measure it has been even before 1987 and continues till this day. This talk was so important because it's 1987, it's being done in response to uh, societal influences that are trying to say women don't have to be in the home raising kids. They can go out and have a career. And so I think this is why he gave this talk, this fireside, which was important enough for the church then to put into a pamphlet form and then produce on a massive scale and make sure that everybody had a copy. I remember seeing copies of this pamphlet back in the 1980s, as far away from Salt Lake as Austin, Texas. So I know that they had a wide distribution. Do you have a picture of that? There it is. Yeah. To the mothers in Zion. And then you've got the entire text of his remarks in this pamphlet. And so this was definitely put forward as the position of the church. This is not going to be a surprise to any members of the church, and a lot of them can probably remember. I used to hand thought. those out as a bishop. You did? Oh, yeah. We had those in the bishop's office. We could give those to mothers that we needed to shame and guilt trip into doing more or less, depending on whether we liked it or not, you know? How many did you give out in your career as a bishop? Bill? Oh, I don't know. Probably zero, but they were definitely in the office. Okay. I didn't like give out the, to the somewhere. one either. What's that? Just an old box of them somewhere or something. There was a lot of old stuff that we discarded in my uh, my time. Um, yeah. Okay. When was it you were a bishop again? Oh, my goodness. Um, the questions will only was, get harder. I know. I was, I was 29 years old when I became bishop. I was born in 78, so 88, oh 98, 2008, and 2007. And the train is traveling at 35 miles an hour heading east. <laughs> so what was the year? What was 2007. The year? Okay, so 2007. So this is actually 20 years after the talk was given. Notice Brother Wilcox is with us too, just FYI. And it's so great that Brother Wilcox is here. I understand he has a little more spare time on his hands now. <laughs> I love the comments, and they really are distracting. I understand why RFM doesn't like watch them, but I love I don't. I see him. Like, what we should be asking is, I've seen several already come up. Oh, I think yeah. one of the that stood out to me in this clip um, was – Ezra Taft Benson saying, like, this is the Lord's way. And I really trusted that growing up. I really, truly believed that. This is the Lord's way. This isn't coming from men. This is coming from God. And so it's a lot harder to push back against something like that when you truly, truly believe this is a message from our Heavenly Father. Um, Nicole, do you have any thoughts or, like, other things you want to add about that clip? Oh, definitely. I think it's important to note that I was maybe one when this talk was given. But this was the messaging from President Kimball, President Benson, and my mother and our mother's generation, they were raised on this. So my mother, my young women's leaders, right? These men taught the people who would teach us. And so even though we might feel sort of far removed from that messaging, it absolutely was directly handed to us. Um, as we were being raised by people that it yeah. was taught to firsthand. 
I would say not just them, but the messaging doesn't change. So I feel like even in no. my, like young women materials, like it's still the same David Oak McKay and Kimball and Benson quotes. Um, so I, I really don't think it was that much different from what our mothers got. But we're we're similar in age. We're both oldest daughters. It's a, I think we were both a year old. Like and this when this our poor mothers, you know, had to um, get this messaging um, with us in the home. Um, if, if we have any more comments, we can go on, on this or I, we can go on to the next quote. I just wanted to say one thing is that as a guy in the church, I'm certainly aware of what the prophet is saying. All right. But the thing I'm not aware of is what the women are saying in their meetings, like Relief Society, Young Women's, because I'm not part of that. But I understand that that messaging may have been re-emphasized there as well. Is that right, Nicole? I feel like it was ever present almost constant, especially when it had anything to do with lessons about motherhood or women or the future or planning for your future or the, the stay at home mother model was ever present. I felt like in my upbringing in Davis County, Utah, most of the women in the community I grew up in were stay at home moms. Most of my friends, mothers were stay at home moms. That was modeled on a very large scale within church communities at I that think, time. Yeah. I think some people have even called it the highest and holiest calling that women have. Yes. Yes. The highest and holiest calling your, you know, your divine nature really. And within doctrine, right. The thing that we will be doing for eternity, mothering, right. I don't know, birthing spirits. I have no idea what that means exactly, but that this model continues into eternity. And that became a real hang up for me further into my story, into my mothering, because I did not love it the way that it was sold to me that I would. And it did not fulfill me in the ways that I felt like it was supposed to. This is my eternal calling, my divine nature, why isn't it a little easier? Why don't I like it very much? That is really hard because the problem must be me. <laughs> can't be God. Can't be the prophets. Right. You're a woman. I put up this quote um, because, yeah, because this goes right into it. This is another one of the teachings is that this is the way that we will be happy. And the only way, really, that as a woman, a woman we will be happy, period. Um so, Nicole, do you want to read this? This was also something I think that you picked up from Gordon B. Higley. Yeah. Women, for the most part, see their greatest fulfillment, their greatest happiness in home and family. God planted within women something divine that expresses itself in quiet strength, in refinement, in peace, in goodness, in virtue. Again, all of this list of things. Sorry, I'm side noting this list of things that I should be and feel as a mother in truth, in love, and all of these remarkable qualities find their truest and most satisfying expression in motherhood. And there's Said a part the man. Of it. Yeah. Do you want to keep oh, he going? continued. Yeah. There's more. The greatest job that any woman will ever do will be in nurturing and teaching and living and encouraging and rearing her children in righteousness and truth. There is no other thing that will compare with that, regardless of what she does. I mean, President Hinckley was the prophet of my youth. And I was fully aware of this messaging. I embraced this messaging as much as possible as a young woman, as a teenager, as a young adult. And then I started to live it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where so many things with the gospel start to become problematic is in our actual lived experiences with them. Is it okay if I pause here? Sorry, I'm going to jump in. Sure. Um, going on this again, that also, I accepted it too. Like this, is, that this is truth again from a prophet that if I want to be unhappy in life, this is the only way to do it. Um, and besides that, I wanted to get into like the element of sacrifice because this is where, um, I mean, we talk about how like the, um, gender roles in the church hurt both men and women, which is true. But, uh, Nicole was saying the, it's really disproportionate how the family teachings affect women versus the men. And so I so I did want to bring this up like before we go it, because we'll see it, 
both for Nicole and for myself, yeah. like how this happened. Huge disparity, huge yeah. disparity. The lion's share comes here. And I feel like the reason why is be, we're expected to sacrifice anything and everything um, for that, for motherhood and also for our marriages. So, you know, husband's education, like I, our education will always be secondary to that. Um, and it just goes on from there. So yes, I, I tell uh, my husband that my job as a Mormon woman is to make his life and the lives of my children possible. I am the behind the scenes person that makes all the living possible. That's my job. <laughs> it's right. not to make my life possible or the things I want to do possible. Right. Exactly. And and while there's things that like we may get to have. I mean, like our educations, both of us did, like we're able to get our degrees, but if there was a point where our degrees were going to get in the way of marriage or children, um, we they, we knew like we would be expected to let that go and drop it. And, and, so, and many women have, I know many yeah, women who didn't absolutely. graduate from college. Well, it's, it's actually famous, isn't it? You go to BYU as a woman to get your MRS degree. The MRS degree, right. Yeah. And and I did, I know so many women who really did want it, um, and not just that, but even like you know missions. There was I I've known women who wanted to serve a mission, but because there was the right guy there, and they were in love, and maybe because the guy said he wouldn't wait, you know, they they give up the mission to to go ahead and get married because you're not supposed to put those things off. And so um, so like going through, I was able to do a lot of the things I wanted to do, but it it was conditional. It was the the fact that there wasn't a guy there that I had to give those things up for, it was a get to. It's kind of like a bonus, if that makes sense. Everything I wanted to do was something that I hoped that I could get done, you know, before marriage, but ultimately was up to God and I was ready to let all of it go. And there were two things specifically, the mission and then BYU Jerusalem that require you to be single. Um, married students are not allowed at the Jerusalem Center right now under like the um, condensed version that they have going. So yeah, so there's like two things specifically that marriage would ruin for me or like I would have to be off the table. So the fact that I got to do them, I just felt lucky if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, there's, there's just nothing about us as individuals that isn't subject to at least the possibility of sacrificing um, on this altar of motherhood because nothing matters more than our ability to bear and raise these children. And, um, and I have, I guess, like two extremes, like this from the like very, very small, tiniest pleasures that you might get to um, I, the, the ultimate sacrifice. So let's start with the small. Um, this is, a, I think, a pretty well-known clip among our audience, um, but I'll go ahead and, and put that up if that's okay. So you guys will probably recognize this here. One second. My next story is about a woman I'll call okay. Mary. She was the daughter of faithful pioneer parents who had sacrificed much for the gospel. She had been married in the temple and was the mother of ten children. She was a talented woman who taught her children how to pray, to work hard, and to love each other. She paid her tithing and the family rode to a church together on Sunday in their wagon. Though she knew it was contrary to the word of wisdom, she developed the habit of drinking coffee and kept a coffee pot on the back of her stove. She claimed that the Lord will not keep me out of heaven for a little cup of coffee. But because of that little cup of coffee, she could not qualify for Temple Recommend. And neither could those of her children who drank coffee with her. But only one of her ten children had a worthy temple marriage, and a great number of her posterity, which is now in its fifth generation, live outside of the blessings of the restored gospel she believed in. What stood out to me about this clip was that it, it really is just one thing that she liked and it has been ascribed the reason that generations are lost from the church. And even beforehand, she talked about how she was a, a righteous believer, all the great things that she taught her children. But none of that matters. None of that matters because of this drink that she liked to drink. She ruined eternity for so many of her family. It, and, and we it don't just, hear one word about the father of those children or what his role might have been in the family right. or no 
the pressure, the weight of the family unit falls squarely on the shoulders of the women. And the leaders wonder why, like, we're hard on ourselves sometimes. Like, why are the women of the church why like we're so all, you know, Because it's no person. mistake can really <laughs> ruin everything, you know? It, you know, it's just, it's just that level of ridiculous. Um, and then, of course, like, the other end of it is that um, I, we don't really get to make decisions for ourselves and our bodies. It's not ours to make. It's, it's Heavenly Father's decision. And this is, set, like, shown in a lot of ways. I mean, I mean, for one, the prescribed path, which which is the path that Nicole went on, once you get married, like, you're not supposed to delay trying or starting to have children. So it's it's once you're married or once you're engaged, really, like you're on this train that's going and it's going to be hitting all the stations and you're you're along for the ride. You're supposed to start having your children. And um, I, I'm just going to like briefly call back to this Neil Anderson's talk in um, I want to say, I think it was April 2021 general conference. He gives an example of a woman who had difficult pregnancies and yet um, like during general conference, she gets this impression and the wording she said, we knew that God had a different plan for us than we had ourselves. So she, they have another difficult pregnancy and another child. And in the delivery room of that child, she gets another impression. So she says again, um, you know, that there's one more, they have another difficult pregnancy, another child. And the, the conclusion was being open to the Lord's direction and following his plan for us will always bring greater happiness than relying on our own understanding. So even here, like she didn't decide, this was God telling her what her body was to be used for, this is to have more children. Does that make sense? So we, we don't really get to decide if we're ready or not, if we want to or not, that's already decided for us. Nicole, Do you mind if I finish the yeah. next half of my story? Yeah. Is that all right? Is this a good place to do that? Yeah. Okay. So my husband, it was time. It was time for us to go back to school and get the doc. It was time for him to go back to school and get his doctoral degree. And he applied to a lot of different programs. He had built a really successful high school program he had interviews at really fantastic programs, and we decided on Florida State University as um, the place that we would go. And Florida State University, in part, the reason we chose it is because it has a 100% job placement rate for its graduates, and that was really important to us because we had been so prayerful about our plan, but we also felt that we needed to reduce as much risk as possible on our end. So we sold our home. And the plan was to live for the three years on what we had sold our home for. We moved to Florida with our children. That picture that was up of my children, our family picture, that was just weeks before we moved to Florida. Our youngest was four months old and we moved to Florida. My husband did a wonderful job. He was a fantastic student. Our last year, the dissertation year of that degree I was serving as a Relief Society president. COVID had hit. I was homeschooling my children. I was editing that dissertation four or five hours a day. And I was packing up our home because it was almost time to move to wherever we were going to get a job. And as it got closer to graduation, he had been he had been in the finalist of candidates for a few jobs, but had not received a job offer. And as it got closer, we doubled down. We fasted more. We prayed. We were going to the temple. We we were doing the things we had always done. We were doing the formula, right? A plus B equals C. If you are faithful, if you keep commandments, then the Lord will bless you. This is what you do. A plus B equals C in the gospel. And there was a job that came up at the very end of our time there. And it was perfect. And it had just seemed to sort of fall into our laps. And I saw it as a miracle. And I had written in my journal the day that we found out about this job that I knew this was our job. I knew that the Lord had waited until the 11th hour of our trial to bless us and that he would work this miracle in our lives and how grateful I was that the Lord had been mindful of us. And a few weeks later, we found out we didn't get the job. And 
that was it. That was the end of the jobs available for that round of hiring. So we packed up our home. We brought our four children back to Utah to live with my grandparents while we continued to look for permanent employment. And we have been here for two years, just, just about two years. And we are still looking for permanent employment. And again, it just, it just all sort of crumbled and it left me really reflecting on a lot of things, but especially my role and my framework as a woman in the church. One of the biggest questions I have been sitting with is this idea that Maven was talking about. Have I ever made a decision for myself as a woman in the church? Marriage, degree, children, staying at home. And kind of the soul-sucking truth of it is, I did make my decisions, but I also made them within this framework that now feels really manipulative to me. So it can be both. Both things can be true. But here I am as a person realizing that I had given control of the biggest decisions of my life to someone else. I had given them to prophets and apostles. I didn't even think about them. I didn't even question the system. I just checked the boxes because I knew I believed so strongly in the promises and blessings associated with that. And so sitting in the rubble of what had become of our lives and our plans, I had to realize that I had done that. I had given up control to other people. I had dictated those choices to other people. And that that is not a fun place to sit. (laughs) Was there any place during this, Nicole, that you thought it must be your fault? Oh, I think, I definitely think that because within the equation, God is the perfect party. So God is the one who always keeps his promises. And so if there is a weak link in the equation, it always feels like us. And I think as women, especially If there's a a weak link in the motherhood framework or anything like that, it must be me. Like I said, I I kept thinking, I I want to enjoy this more. I, I want to feel fulfilled in my motherhood. I want to feel more natural in this role that apparently I was born to play. And when you don't feel natural in it or you struggle with it, gosh, women who struggle with infertility or who there are so many layers to the motherhood conundrum. Any of these women will tell you on any layer that it must be them. There must be a commandment. There must be more that the Lord requires before they fit into that framework in whatever direction they're approaching it from. And that was absolutely me. I I have four children And I think if I wanted to maintain optimal and physical and emotional mental health, I maybe should have had two, but I saw that as continuing to exercise my faith, that if I continue to lean into this role, that it would one day feel the way it was supposed to feel for me. And having children because you are supposed to is not the reason to have children. (laughs) It is not a reason to become a parent, but it, it was just another sort of box that needed to be checked that, that needed to happen so that the Lord would be pleased with the life we were creating. And I told Maven this when we were visiting earlier, one of the saddest parts about that for me is that I see people who have children because they truly, truly desire them for no other reason than that they want to have children. And in the timeline, yeah, in their timeline, and they love, there is just this beautiful ownership of parenthood for them. And they seem to just really love it. And I really feel like I was robbed of some of that joy in mothering because I did it because I was supposed to. And I never felt comfortable stepping away from that or putting the brakes on 
right? The opposite is true. If the formula is not working, it's you lean in harder, right? Make your covenants. But when the army's coming, bury your weapons, right? Lean in, don't pull back is always the message. And so I felt like I was leaning in and so, yeah, it was always, it's always you, right? If you're not receiving blessings from the Lord. And not just us, but this is something just about any doctrine in the church. If anything that goes wrong, there's some way to blame the person. But I want, I just like, I want to say the subreddits um, are full of stories of, of women like this and, and, and they all say that, like, I love my children. Like, I've never seen a woman say, like, I would, like, send one of them back or something. Um, but a lot of them say the same thing, that I, I had them too early, like, before I was ready. A lot of times, like, I was still a child myself, basically, 18 or 19 sometimes. Um, and, the, and yeah, and, and having too many more than they yeah. can handle. Well, but, and this cruel like, – oh, sorry, go ahead. It just, it just doesn't matter – what you can handle that's never an issue so your your mental health your physical health that you don't matter and this these so. are sacrifices that i feel like men are almost completely unaware of just the toll it takes on a mind and body to bring a child into the world is is just even something that is never acknowledged it's never appreciated i mean childbirth was the number one killer of women i think into the 1930s and that, right, fatherhood isn't really a number one killer of anyone. I guess that could be terrible, but, right, just this acknowledgement that, gosh, could we just acknowledge what we are asking instead of just, instead of just You're thinking it's a given. Acknowledge, but We're treating you like brood mares. That we'll just do it. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I, I do hear like husbands saying like it's they're they're grateful for what their wives have been through and and they'll even say like I couldn't do it you know which of course you know we know but they just I think because of the church's <laughs> teachings that this is our only role and this is what we're made for it's easy for them to take for granted that we do it it's our job it's what we were made for so even though we are taking this risk it's part of the package. Yes. And then women sit in this really uncomfortable, painful place. I would not, right? Which one of my children am I going to give back? I would not give back any of my children. So we have women who have, you know, a hundred regrets and none at all at the same time. I feel that way. I would not give back my children. I love my children. But the mourning and the grief for not feeling in charge of my own choices or not fully feeling in charge of my own choices is still a part of my motherhood journey as much as the love for my children is. And we sit in that. We just sit in it because there's nowhere to put it. There's no acknowledgement of it. There's not really space for women like that to be vocal in the church because that's just contrary. And again, when your lived experience does not match up with what it's supposed to be, that is very threatening to other members of the church. And I think something RFM said, women tend to be, I think, the most threatened by other women in the church who choose differently. And that is very interesting as well. And I I want to jump in here. I'm kind of the other side of uh, the coin um, because, I mean, because I, I am and have been single this whole time. So I, um, I also was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I mean, I did have that difficult conversation with one, I guess, opportunity. <laughs> um, so I guess one could maybe wonder, was that my opportunity that I gave up and maybe like by that, like, these are the kinds of thoughts that like that you have, um, is that because I, I, I passed on an opportunity from like a worthy, RM priesthood holder, I did I lose the ability to get married as a punishment? And there are stories like that. And I feel like snippets and talks like that, that kind of, I guess, kind of imply that, you know, if a guy's not good enough for you when you're younger, look what happens when you're get, you get older and nobody wants you. It's like a comeuppance that you dare not be interested in somebody that was interested in you, if that makes sense. Um, but besides that, just, um, I mean, I still 
didn't choose to be a career person. I, I'm still not. So it's not like I, I, you know, chose to give up marriage. I, that was never part of it. I was always feeling like I'm supposed to. And as, as a single woman in the church, like you're not a, really a whole person or even a real adult until you're married. You're in a temporary space. You're an unfinished product, basically. And so I was dating. I was going to the YSA wards to like failed out. Um, you graduate, I guess, by getting married and you fail out and you go into the SA wards, you know, when you're old enough that you no longer qualify to be in the YSA wards. But still, like um, the the teaching is always, first of all, never settle, like always go for a worthy priesthood holder. If they're an RM, that's great. They don't absolutely have to be, but definitely a worthy priesthood holder. But that's the most important qualification right. of anything else. <laughs> don't, yeah, definitely not a non-member, like no matter how amazing this guy might be, like that, that is absolutely settling. And so, yeah, so when you're younger, it's, you know, temple marriage, temple marriage, temple marriage, never settle for anything less than that, you know, and then uh, when, if you're like me and you start getting older, the messaging starts to change a little bit. And it starts to be like, are you being a little too picky? Maybe, maybe you're too independent now. Maybe you're too ambitious. Um, maybe you're too vocal, you know, because I was starting to get a bit more liberal the older I got and, and just less impressed with patriarchy in general and, and what I was facing in marriage. But I still wanted it because I still wanted to be righteous and I still wanted to do the right thing, you know. Um, and then I, I struggled a lot financially as well not because of having children or like a husband um, that needed support, but because I wasn't supposed to have a career. And every year that passed by that I still was not married, I still just thought like, just because I've had this long being single, that doesn't mean I can't meet the guy tomorrow even. I might, I could be married by the end of the year. Like these things happen quickly in our culture, you know? And so at any point, if I ever started to think maybe I should try to find an actual career that makes money that I like, that I can go for, it felt wrong to me because it felt like an admission that I no longer trusted God to provide for me, to provide this, you know, promised husband from my righteousness. Um, and that, yeah, basically it was, it was a, a, a direct act to show that I did not have faith in God anymore for these promises. So I just kept going just year after year, like it'll happen anytime now. Um, but I, I mean, gratefully, I think more, you know, as time started to pass, I actually did start to be more okay with it and actually more glad not to have been married. Um, but anyway, that was still my experience starting out on the other side of things. So. Can I, you guys are doing great. And somebody told me not to talk to females as guys tonight. Sorry. It's a, <laughs> it's a provincial thing is what it is. I think you ladies are doing great what you're talking about. I just want to, in the interest of time, can we just steer this now to the second part of the discussion? Because this messaging that the church has been giving has been consistent, as we've shown with clips and with uh, the quotes that you found. But there is also a different message that the church is getting out about women in the church in different venues than in general conference and places like that. Did you want to start talking about that, Maven and Nicole? Yeah, yeah let's um, do we have the clip. Do we want to start off with the clip and go from there? Which or do you clip want to start is it? First? Um, the uh, I'm a Mormon uh, campaign. Can, we, can, can I just tell my story? Yes. Let me tell my yes. story because my story is about a woman. And what it was was this is uh, the I'm a Mormon camp. <laughs> Sorry. There's go a ahead. lot. There's things about me you wouldn't understand, Bill. <laughs> things you couldn't understand. <laughs> things you shouldn't understand. Probably don't want to understand. Okay. Well, anyway, so it's back in 2012. <laughs> Mitt Romney's running for president. The church is gearing up its I'm a Mormon campaign before it was a victory for Satan. And they have all these clips, right? Well, uh, of these different people, uh, most of whom are outrageously not Mormon looking folks and not living in a Mormon way. And so I'm going over to home teach this middle aged lady. And she's a good Mormon. Uh, she had gone to some college, I think, and then probably dropped out to get married, uh, has kids. Uh, at this point, she's a single woman, but she still has the kids, right? And she's been at home taking care of the kids, doing what she can. And my companion, I wasn't even aware of the I'm a Mormon campaign, except I'd sort of heard it. I hadn't watched any of the videos. I wasn't that interested in it. 
but he starts gushing. It's this younger companion, right? He's a priest or something. And uh, he starts gushing about this one video he'd seen about this lady uh, in the I'm a Mormon campaign and how she has this full career and she's got kids at home and she's, uh, you know, it ends with I'm a Mormon. And I thought, hmm, okay, well, that's interesting. But the thing that was notable was the response in the lady that we were home teaching because she got very upset. I mean, she started crying, visibly upset. And she started saying that, well, what about me? I did everything I was supposed to do. I gave up a career that I wanted to have. And are you telling me that the church is now saying that it's a good thing for women to have careers outside the home? And that's not the message I was getting, is what she was saying. So that was a very memorable occasion. And we have a clip. I don't know if this is the exact clip because there are tons of clips. By the way, these clips are still up on the church's website. I think it's called comeintochrist.org. But they still have all the I'm a Mormon videos up. And I think there might be, you know, they're working at cross purposes with each other about this whole Mormon thing. But we found one. And the thing that was interesting to me about this is when you watch this, and it's about three minutes long, but when you contrast this video with the messages that the leaders of the church have been given to women about what they should do and see how this is diametrically opposed to those messages, that's what I think is interesting. And that's what I want to um, play and then end up the conversation about that and what both Maven and Nicole do when you encounter this kind of mixed messaging. So I think I'm only going to play the first minute. That's the most relevant, but I'll, I'll okay. go ahead and add that up. Sometimes I hate that I have a long commute to work, and sometimes I think it is a, a blessing in disguise because I have an hour to kind of just breathe, which is kind of the, as a transport nurse, that's the mode you live in. The whole idea is to get to your patient as quickly and safely as possible and then package them up and get them back to base as, as fast as you can. You know, it's frantic. I love taking care of kids. I like being able to help when things are crazy. It is charged with emotion because no kid comes alone. Every kid comes as a package with a family who is invested and terrified and worked up and all they want to know is, are they going to be okay? I love being able to be in that moment and know that I'm going to be able to rise to the occasion and do what I need to do. I want to come running up on these trails. This would be my personal running habit right here. Yeah, it's pretty nice. It's my passion to do what I feel like I do best, care for people in a charged environment. It's amazing, and I love it. What do you think about your mom? <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> Most of the time. Life being so busy, I work full time, my husband works full time, we juggle a family, and I feel like when we play, we try to play and have fun and make it great, because it really is all about the quality of the time, because sometimes the quantity isn't as much as we like, but when we have time, we try to have fun. Okay, yeah, and I'm watching this and I'm going, what are you doing? I mean, at the very end, she does say, you know, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm a Mormon. But she's got kids at home. I work full time. My husband works full time. We have, we don't have a lot of time with the kids, but we, we got to make it count. And I'm just going, uh, my head is exploding that this is being put forward by the church in an officially and expensively produced series portraying to the world that this is not only an acceptable, but a, a laudatory role for a woman to play as a Mormon. Your thoughts? It's exactly opposite of this talk by Ezra Taft Benson in multiple ways, because, I mean, he does specifically talk about being outside of the home. She should be there. And and quality over quantity would not have worked with him either, because it is quantity. If there's things taking you away, social things, activities, even like the children's activities, if they're, they're getting in the way of things, you cut those out and, and you are at home all the time. And there's even a quote, it, it like... Like one of the things he said is that so many divorces can be traced to when women start working outside of the home. And he pleads at the end of that for women to come home, for women who are working to find ways to come home. Women come home to your husbands and even says like, like make their beds and <laughs> do these things. It's a terrible, terrible talk. But these are all like all of these things that she said are exactly opposite of what like we are told to do. 
What did you think about the I'm a Mormon campaign when it came out 10 years ago, Nicole? Okay, so when it came out, <laughs> I I didn't feel as conflicted about it. I think my thoughts were, this is a brilliant PR campaign that the church has put together. Now, where my fit critical thinking skills sort of failed me was brilliant PR moves are usually in response to something that you are trying to fix or cover or spin. And I think what we saw with that and what we saw with the Mormon Minute, where the church was really trying to thrust its successful women into the spotlight, right? Women with successful careers. What we're seeing there is the picture we would like to present to the world of Mormon women to draw more people to the church, right? It's a missionary tool, but women in the church are actually getting a really different message than this. Um, Is that right? If I talk about sister Renlund, can I move into that a little bit? Please. Okay. Uh, One, when you describe that experience um, where that woman started to cry after this man shared with her this video, I had a very similar experience when Elder Renlund was called to be an apostle. His wife is an incredibly successful lawyer and together they have one child. And part of that is because of a physical, um, she was diagnosed with cancer and had to have a hysterectomy and various procedures, but they did not pursue adoption. And she worked outside the home when her daughter was young to pursue, to go to law school and pursue a career. And when he was called, there was an interview published with Sister Renlund. And one of the last things she says in the interview is, I have learned that there is no right way to be a Mormon woman. Do you that have it there? Was... I almost feel like I should ask Bill to read it. He's been uncharacteristically silent tonight. <laughs> He's thinking about the bowling game. Oh, I could do it. I'll just, yeah, if you've got it there. Are... There we go. I'm going to stop moving it. There you go. One thing I've always felt strongly about is that there's no, no one way to be an LDS woman. Each has a right to personal revelation and is expected to use that. It should be personal, and we shouldn't let other people's comments shake our direction. I think women are particularly susceptible to that. I'll, I'll just pipe in just to say what a double message, right? Like you, I was just writing down here notes. Uh, Nelson talks about uh, going off to priesthood session, the women making cookies. Elder Ballard talked about put a little lipstick on. Uh, he also said to talk, but don't talk too much. Um, <laughs> we're, women are constantly being told how to be a good Mormon woman. And then for her to say that seems so blatantly ignorant of the Mormon messaging that came before her. A hundred percent. And she's the daughter of a former general authority. So it's not like she wasn't aware. Can you pull that quote up one more time? Who, who's she the daughter she, of? Oh, is it Libert, Libert. Libert, something Libert, like that. Libert, Elder Libert. Yeah. He was Libert. like, he was up there and then she, he became a general authority. And so she comes from, um, good stock. Um, she says, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is it Libby? Let me it she says, you know, it should be a personal, what does she say? Here we go. Each has a right to personal revelation and expose you that it should be personal and we shouldn't let other people's comments. If she's talking about the comments of prophets and apostles. Right. We shouldn't let, we shouldn't let, we shouldn't let other people's comments. We shouldn't let prophets and apostles comments shake our direction. I think women are particularly susceptible to that. And if I read the quote, the way I changed it, I agree with sister Renland women are particularly susceptible to the comments of prophets and apostles about what it is they should be doing, what it is they should be wearing, how it is they should be acting. And that I agree with. Again, this idea that we put it back on women, you know, if you're not, you should be receiving personal revelation. You don't need to worry about what other people think. And this idea that I'm now feeling like I'm being gaslighted into doubting my my own eyes and ears as to what prophets and apostles have been prescribing for women for decades. And it just, it's fascinating to me to watch this these parallel messages that are opposite, that are running at the same time within a church structure. And 
it is sad to me to think that my lived experience, no one, no one will be held accountable for any of that. Even, even recently, we've stopped talking about stay-at-home moms as often and as forcefully as we used to. And it's just going to slowly be erased in such a way that it's like it didn't exist. It's like the harm that was caused didn't actually happen. It was our own choice. It was our choice. It was my choice. It. Yeah. And it was, right? We talked about this. It was both I, things. That's the but, hard thing. <laughs> right. But taking that, taking both things away and putting it squarely on the shoulders of women. So even according to Sister Renland, even when we're doing it right, according to prophets and apostles, we're doing it wrong because we should be listening to our personal revelation and we shouldn't be as susceptible to these comments. I, I can't do that mental gymnastics anymore as a Mormon woman. I broke a leg or something. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm taken off the roster. <laughs> what is going on in your personal life with regards to your belief in Mormonism? And maybe you can go off of this quote, because I understand that when you first saw or heard this quote from Sister Renland, that it had quite an impact on you. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was a big deal for me. Um, where I am right now, I still, I am still attending church. I have a calling. I am, I am open now to all, all possibilities. I feel like part of my healing and awakening has been this huge self-reclamation I will no longer allow anyone else to dictate spiritual or physical choices that I should be making. And so I'm early in that process of self-reclamation. I've made plans to go back to school. Uh, my goal is to be enrolled by the fall of 2023 in a master's program to go on to be a therapist. And so while, while I believe in empowering myself to do those things, I will be entering the workforce around age 40. And that is also something that is very different than my male counterparts within the church. For the first time, I will be seriously entering a workforce as a 40 year old. And so while that excites me, and I am thrilled about that, again, the mourning and the grief are still very much in tandem with the excitement and the empowerment. So I, it's hard for me to say exactly where I am. I occupy this space right now where post Mormons and Orthodox Mormons are both annoyed <laughs> with me <laughs> a little bit, you know, I, and that's okay. I know this is kind of an odd space to sit in where I'm still attending church while I'm sort of deconstructing and while I'm sort of reclaiming my power. I think it's a good thing um, because I, I mean, this, this uh, is a part where like where my experience is also paralleled where I, I just figured out um, last year, where, like what I want to do in life as well. And I would say the same thing. I, if I were to say like my number one pain point in having been raised the way that I was, it was this, it would be this loss of self, just the fact that I didn't have one and I didn't feel like I really could. Who am um, I? Yeah. In my mid thirties. Yeah. I didn't know. Who am I, I? <laughs> exactly. I didn't I didn't know. And it was really it was a really awful, awful feeling. Um and um I don't remember if I shared this like when I had my episode, but um there was a point where I realized like when and for me this all had to happen after a loss of faith. I don't think I would have been like in your space, I in the church I don't think I could have gotten to where you are getting now while I was still a believer. So that that was why I was originally going to say, I think it's great that you are still there, that you're in this space and that you're reclaiming it. And I'm really hoping that this is actually, that you're not an anomaly, that this is a trend that is starting to grow where more and more women in the church are not listening. The messages are still there, even for the young women now, but they're paying less and less attention and they're giving less weight to it. So that's a really good thing um, because I, 
think you know it, this is going to really start to substantially change the way things are in the church but i i had a moment where when i realized i didn't have this anymore this whole framework that i i didn't know who i was and i i had to like think for a while about it and i was a bit, like i was only able to come up with two things the first was that i knew i want i, I wanted to be an lgbt ally i considered myself one but i'd never done anything so kind of i guess a silent ally which isn't all that great but it, at least it was my ideas like this was definitely not from the church you no know choice. <laughs> like, right i know i know that these are like legitimate things that these aren't choices and that and that people deserve love right so i was like okay that's one thing that's me and that's not from the church and then the second thing was that jujitsu class i had started i'd only been like a few times but like that was nothing to do with the church and so i was like okay maven has two things that are mine <laughs> and and then i had to build from there and as exciting and as happy as i am to have all of these things that i'm doing and honestly the show is the pinnacle of my week every single week this is just like so exciting for me to start discovering myself it's it still hurts the last time it's still yeah hurts. as a fact that I, I have a day job you know that and i love the company that i work for so i'm still doing that but everything i'm doing mormonism like everything i'm learning still has to be on the side i'm still trying to find ways to fit that in to eventually try to make a change but like if i had the ability to do this like 10 years ago like like where could i be now i don't know I'll never know. Yes. It hurts. Well, and then partly why like these PR campaigns hurt so much because like you said, on one hand, like we do know that there's these women are, are proof that somewhere along the line, maybe we could have done the same thing. We could have claimed something back of ours earlier, you know? So it, it hurts to kind of feel that and recognize that, but also I mean, even though like there's there's truth to that, these women are often being used to blame us and to gaslight us, like you said, that that it's our fault that we that like we didn't do what they were able to do. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's what's the most hurtful is like the thing that causes me the most pain about this um, is like is my fault. You know, like holy, I, I can I I can say that there's some that maybe somewhere along the way I could have done something different, but. I was trying to be obedient to what I was told. And I trusted these men that they were telling me the truth that this is how I would be happy, you know, and that this is what God wanted for me. I really believed that. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I like something that Nicole said when we were talking just about this pro like process of reclaiming ourselves. You uh, you said it was brutal and beautiful. You put it together. It's brutiful. Brutal. Like, it hurts, <laughs> but it's like, yes. but it's also so amazing and so empowering that like I both of us felt the same. Like we we love being in this space right now, and we love the pain and the joy that comes with figuring it out. Yes. Who we are and what we want. Yes. And I, part of that for me, still being in the church, still being active, part of what fulfills me in that church activity is this nuanced voice that I feel like I can authoritatively bring to the table because it is my lived experience as a woman in the church. And I don't have to prove my lived experience. It stands on its own. And I, like you, think that regardless of where my spiritual journey takes me, while I am here, that is how I can add value to the space that I'm occupying is by raising my voice so that other women don't feel so alone or they don't feel so ostracized for having normal human feelings about their roles and things that have been prescribed to them. I agree. I feel like the church needs people like you to be safe spaces, not just for these women, but also like the young women. I think your children and their peers as they're, you know, growing up and getting older. Um, as long as you're in the church and you're able to kind of moderate that at least a little bit, I think that that's helpful. Um, 
I was gonna, yeah. I, I lost my train of thought. I was gonna say something else. Oh, I mean, just like BYU has like professors who are safe that are, you know, safe places for um, people who are LGBTQ. As much as like we dislike the institution and the harm that they're causing, um, and and we might be like, why are you there, you know, professor? Like, why are you supporting this? Um, there are people who are in these difficult places that really, I, you know, I, I think it is important. Yes, to I think it needs the church to an extent needs its detractors in a way that they'll never admit, but that's where change Inside and out. comes from. Yep. Inside and out. I think Elder Oaks addressed that very issue in general conference not too many years ago, didn't it's he? It's so though? loyal opposition, right? <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Peter Bleakley. I had to find that out the hard way. <clears throat> yeah, questions are honored. Opposition is not. I've got that sound bite here somewhere. And you know something else? And we need to open this up for phone calls just because I know a lot of people are going to want to talk to Nicole and probably to Maven as well and have questions. But it does strike me as you're speaking that Ruth uh, Rinland, that little lawyer firebrand, of a woman in the LDS church who's making these comments about personal revelation, doing it your own way, you know, we not according to what other people tell you to do, is also the same woman who appeared with her husband and repeatedly gave this talk about a parable likening the church to a dilapidated dinghy oh, yeah. <laughs> with his old crusty sailor who smells and has flies buzzing around him and saying that this person, this little kid who got picked up out of the water right now wants off. And don't, you know, don't go back into the water. You need to stay in this dilapidated dinghy of a church. So even her fire brandiness, if that's a word, has its limits, or at least she's willing to conform it when she's giving the public message. What do you yes. think about that? <laughs> yes, I think... I think just like we watch many members of the LDS LGBTQ community who have severe internalized homophobia, I think we also see so many women in the church who have this internalized sexism and misogyny. And in a way, when we have that and experience that, again, we become very fierce defenders of the system that is doing harm even while it's doing harm to us. And I watch, I watch women who may be seen as a little more progressive in leadership. And if you watch carefully, there is a very specifically choreographed, it feels like to me, dance where you can be a little bit progressive, you can encourage certain things, and then you sort of pull back a little bit, or then you toe the line. Yes. You the line. Line. And again, you just deliver sort of mixed messaging. Women need to be receiving personal revelation as long as it doesn't contradict prophetic revelation, but definitely receive personal revelation because then when things go wrong, we can blame you for not receiving your personal revelation, which we told you all along was the most important revelation, except for when we didn't tell you that. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Oh, so did you have something else you want to say, Maven? Or are you ready to open up the phone lines? I should say this to Bill. I think we're losing Billy. Starting to no, no. lose there. Are you? No, okay, no, Bill? no. So I, I've got COPD, and I've been up since early this morning for that <laughs> 21st Century Saints interview. So you might see me yawn once in a while, but that's mostly because I've got COPD. Um, I've got already the call-in studios running. I'm waiting for a call to come in. The number's at the bottom. This we call the Victory for Satan segment simply because it contains the mark of the beast. And uh, it is, I believe, 662 Mormons with an S on the end. Or, can I say one more please. thing while we're yeah. waiting? I have been kind of reading a few of the comments as they've come in. Hmm. They're women who are sharing similar experiences or who are bringing up things like, you know, how women staying at home discourages divorce because they're not financially independent. We're seeing women who are commenting about their lived experiences and the things that they've noticed. And I was telling Maven earlier that I, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I just feel like I'm continuing to collect more and more of these things and I keep expecting to run out. I keep expecting that I'll find an end 
to the ways that the messaging is harmful and the ways that women are not equal and the ways that women struggle against this system. And I, I have not come to an end. I don't think there is an end to that. And so this, this idea of women's roles in the church and the female experience of being in the church is so layered, so nuanced. There are as many stories as there are women. And I just, I just wanted to honor that really quickly that Maven and I seem to be two sides of the same coin, a very interesting dichotomy, married with children, single without children, both women in a system that preaches family both struggling with the same framework in different ways. And I just wanted to honor that there are women struggling within this framework in a million different ways. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because I, I did want to put, this is something else that you said, part of why I think the reason why we support these systems and, and part of why we're defenders of it is because once it starts to unravel, it all comes so quickly. So I think it, it's a mental protection for ourselves. It's to terrifying. Yeah, to not like push or like, you know, go beyond that as much to, to toe the line, to, to keep the narrative going because it does start to fall apart really quickly. And and I, I wanted to bring this up because it's this is not just a like a new generational thing where, you know, us as millennials, I, I think we're on the older end of the millennial generation, like that, that this is new and because of like modernity, we're experiencing this. Um, I don't know if we could touch on this real quick before phone calls. Our mothers are also victims of not getting the promised blessings you know that that they thought that they were going to get because that's a big part of it we're we're expected to do all of these sacrifices but we're promised all along the way that it's going to work out for us so so for my mom she came from a jack mormon broken home it was abusive it was neglectful it was very sad she was also the old, oldest daughter and uh, the care of the family fell to her but she also had this messaging you know she she hung everything her happiness on a white knight in shining armor taking her to his castle, which in Mormondom is a worthy RM priesthood holder and a temple marriage. Like that is the castle. She hung everything on that and it didn't work out for her as well either. She had to work outside the home. So she had a lot of guilt over that and she wasn't happy. And it, and it was very clear that she wasn't, although she wanted to be. And I, I had a school assignment once where I, I was supposed to ask my parents, like, what did they used to want to be when they grew up? And when I asked my mom this question for this assignment, um, I, the answer frustrated me at the time because it, it did not help me at all, but it was the most honest answer she could give. She said, happy. That was the answer to that question for that school assignment. And um, so I don't know, Nicole, do you want to talk about like your mom and the, the promised blessings that, that she's not seeing and, and kind of what that's happening, how that's happening for her? Sure. And if my mom were here, her experience would be really different than mine. Uh, my mother was, is such, she's such a wonderful mother. She, she did such a beautiful job raising us. And I think she really thrived within that. She she loved that. She loved being a stay at home mom. I watched her love that. And, and, but I think where I saw that not line up for her, um, and in an effort not to speak too much for her, but where I saw that not line up for her is that I'm the oldest of six children. She did every single thing, right? She taught us the gospel beautifully and three of my siblings have left the church very definitively. And I saw how painful that was for her. And I mourned that with her um, because that was, that was what she had dedicated her life to. And, and it's a very specific promise. Yeah. And she would, and she would probably say, and I would say too about my own life. Like I have a lovely life. I have beautiful children. I have a husband who I love and is supportive and wonderful. And my mother has a wonderful life as well. But again, 
part of what comes with that is the grief and mourning for the things that you thought were certain because you trusted and you you really wanted to lean into this specific formula. Yep. And so again, it's less now because more and more people are leaving the church. So it's a little bit more obvious, but I think for our mothers, it, it was absolutely promised all the time that like, if you do all of these things, your children will not go astray. They will stay in the gospel. You will have that. They will marry in the temple. You'll all be together happily ever after. And yes. you know, all these things, if you get married in the temple, like this will increase your children's chances, you know, of doing that. And then also like the family home evening and the scripture study and the family prayer. And you, your family did all of those things, all right? All of those things. Your mother yes. did all of the things. And yet half of her children in her belief system are not going to be there in heaven with her anymore. And I think, I think there are ways to navigate when the system, when the equation doesn't work, when A plus B doesn't equal C. And I think the biggest one for women in the church, especially really faithful women in the church, is that there must have been something they did, like we have reiterated many times, or you can start to pull back that curtain and pulling back that curtain on messaging that you received is terrifying, right? We preach safety and security within the church. And there is truth in that, that if you, if you do not have to move into terrifying ter territory, if you can help it, just, just stay here where it's safe. And so... I think the way people navigate that and deal with that, especially women, it's hard for me to say that not every journey is valid. You know, the journey of closing the curtain and stepping back, if that is what you can do, if that is where you are, that's valid. We honor that. I honor that. I respect that. And I think, I think something truly tragic is that we have created a a church culture and construct where when we are struggling in a specific way, especially with our faith, it is very hard. It's very isolating because it is very hard to find people who are also struggling. We are really discouraged from rehearsing our doubts with other doubters and reaching <laughs> out to other people, right? Sorry. That is yeah. really discouraged. And so you are just left to process in isolation. And again, it's important for me personally to make sure that we acknowledge the many, many different ways that women struggle and the many, many different ways they choose to cope with that and honor that as real and as valid, even if it's not the way we're coping with it, or even if it's not what we think might be best for them. Can I come in here with a question for Nicole? It's something we yes. talked about before, I know. And in the absence of any calls in the queue, Bill, you You're may muted. be muted. We have three of them ready. Oh, okay. Well, let's just go to the calls. But one thing I did want to talk, uh, you to address, if you can, Nicole, is the fact that you being an active member, your mother being active, three of your siblings having left, you're the oldest. You are under a great deal of pressure, as yes. one might put it. and um, And yet... You're, t you're making the dicey move of appearing on a show like this and telling your story. Why is it? So brave. Yeah, why is it? I, I was talking um, to no. Maeve and she's saying how brave it is and I agree. But why is it that you're willing to take, well, that risk, if I can put it that way? For me, this particular moment is very meaningful. It's a very important step in my process of self-reclamation. One that was just handed to me by you, RFM. Thank you. <laughs> I have been, I have been making the choices to disappoint myself in order to please other people my entire life. And part of reclaiming who I am means that when I'm given the choice between disappointing other people and disappointing myself, I have to choose to disappoint other people every time. It's a conscious, deliberate effort for me in 
finding out who I am and making choices that, that are not other people's to make. And being heard is important in that process as well. And this, this is something that I think needs to be heard. We need to hear it together. We need men to hear it. We need women to hear it. We need to build this net of vulnerability and connection in an effort to reclaim ourselves in a way. And part of that for me, I still believe in God and Jesus. And there are things about the church that I still really hold very dear. Um, but part of that is not allowing anyone to stand between me and what I think is best for me spiritually um, anymore. So that this this is terrifying for me. I will absolutely admit that I am I am terrified at how wide an audience this might reach. I am really nervous about family members and friends who don't know as much about my experiences and the feelings that I have finding this, but it is important to me <laughs> that even in the face of fear, I'm choosing myself instead of choosing to please other people. <laughs> Yay. Love it. Love it. All right. Um, Carrie is on the line. Carrie, you're on Mormonism Live. Um, what can we do for you? What's on your mind? Hey, um, yes. I just want to say that I have related to almost everything that Nicole has said. I mean, we almost could be the same people, up to and in, including like serving a mission in Canada around the same time, getting married right after around 2011, having kids out of a sense of duty and obligation. Um, all of all of those things. So I have to say that I had I had two kids right off the bat, right after I got married, and it just I think that's what triggered. Well, I think getting married and then having kids right away triggered my uh, faith crisis because it was not at all. It was told I was told that it would be like everything I could want, the the highest thing I could achieve, and it was devastating. It was it, I was miserable. It was so hard. It it just it 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 felt like a massive failure. I felt like a failure as, as not being able to find that like that peace and joy that came from having kids. And so I, I have to say like I ended up having a kid. Um, I had two kids right off the bat. And then I had a kid five years later. And the experience with him was so much different from my other two because I wanted to have him. I chose to have him. And I was able to appreciate every single moment with him, enjoy the time with him in a way that I didn't with the other two. And I do love my other kids. But that 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 contrast was stark, and I, I, I completely um, relate. The only other thing I wanted to throw in there is um, the idea that men just don't understand. This is Nicole was saying this, but men do not understand that experience for women and what we go through. Um, RFM, I love you to death, but I remember a few weeks ago when it was um, when Maven was sharing, sharing her experience, and you just said something. I mean, I think it was when Maven was crying. And you said, that never occurred to me. <laughs> it never occurred to you um, what it would be like from the eyes or experience of a woman. And that is so real. Like men just cannot, I think, for the most part, and I, I, you know, I hate to generalize, but they cannot really grasp the experience that women are going through. And, and the daily uh, reminders that we, we get of our proper place within you know, Mormonism and, and society. Um, and, and that leads into my thought of why women need to be in those leadership positions, because as great, as great, with quotation marks, as the, as the um, leaders of the church are, they're men, and they don't understand what it's like to be women. I mean, even up to the fact that um, they didn't understand that our garments were causing us, like, yeast infections, like, they just cannot really grasp the concept of what it is to be women, and so any of their policies, any of the things they put in place are or through a male lens, and, and it makes it really hard. So I know I just <laughs> rambled a bit. I'm done, but I really appreciate you guys being Nicole on and Maven too. I love, I love it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Carrie. Hey, I just want you to know that even as I've been talking with Nicole and Maven in preparation for tonight's show, something actually crystallized in my mind, which may seem pretty rudimentary to you and to the other women listeners, which is that out of 1,000 things, that a person can do in this life. 
Men can do 999. Women can do one. Yeah. Or all thousand. No, I'm saying within the Mormon framework. Within the you Mormon understand. framework. Yes. And then and then Elder Oaks, there was a talk where he, I think it's where he mentions like women have priesthood power. But at the end of the talk, he talks about how in the eternities, their job is again to make babies. That's that's their thing. And so while the rest of us, you know, men are paving roads and building buildings and making the celestial kingdom a pleasant place for all of us, women are just somewhere in closed behind, you know, behind closed doors. Uh, producing spirit children. Yes, they're spending yeah. a lot of time in the CDR, the Celestial Delivery Room. <laughs> it's a fun place to be. Yeah. Uh, Suzette is as long on as the line. There are celestial epidurals. I'm, you know. <laughs> Suzette, what's on your mind tonight? Hi. How are you? Hey, I just want to say I'm good. I'm good. I want to say thank you to both Nicole and Maven. You guys nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Like, everything you said i was crying i Thank was laughing i'm about i'm about 15 years older than you so i was in young women when um president benson gave that talk and i was there with my pen poised committing everything to the lord and my life has been amazing and wonderful and mormonism brought me many gifts but there's so much grief like nicole said like there's i basically you know i I gave up the chance to get married and have children at all because I would never settle for someone outside the church until it was too late. You know, I like struggled financially, just like Maven talked about, because I had to be constantly poised and ready to take the, you know, the chance to be married and not have like be in the middle of graduate school. And I just wanted to add my voice as a woman in the church that like, it's, wonderful and it's awful and it's really confusing and really hard to untangle and everything you said I completely related to I spent the last decade of my time in the church like studying priesthood and being very interested in the ordained women movement and and I mean I read everything and what it came down to was one word and that's sexism and then I had to go so Anyway, before I start crying too, because it's super emotional, <laughs> I just want to say like thank you so much for your voices and kudos to Phil and RFM for recognizing this need. I would love to see more women sharing their experience on the show. So thanks everybody. Thanks, Suzette. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say it isn't it so ironic for that for a church that just really beats into us, like that we have this one purpose this one you know of our creation this you know this one thing that actually by also wanting us to be temple married to other mormons because that's what will <laughs> make our children more likely to be mormon that like with me or suzette there are less women who like there are women who could be mothers now that are not because of the church's teachings it's so it's so ironic and very sad I, I have a friend like this. She's dated non-members in the past, and she refuses to now. And I hope she finds somebody. Someone in the comments mentioned about like the numbers. <laughs> it's a numbers game that's not in our favor, especially the older that we get. And so, I mean, I hope she finds somebody. But but she has decided she will not date a non-member again. So she she might be single the rest of her life if she doesn't find somebody. Can I bring up something here? Um, it has to do with Brad Wilcox's fireside. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. There's this fireside <laughs> Who, a few weeks who's ago. Who's Brad Wilcox? Brad Wilcox. He's a he was a youth speaker in the church. I think that's popular. about to suddenly yeah. change. Um, but no, he gave a talk in which he said equally dismissive and I think offensive things to black people as well as to women regarding the priesthood issue. He got called on the carpet for it because it exploded on him. He came out the next day with an apology to uh, the black people that he had offended, but nothing about women and the offensive comments he made about women. What are your thoughts about that, Nicole? Um, we, you know, we won't see that apology. We've never seen that apology. Um, sexism in the church is always the last thing to the table. And I, I am very happy that he, 
you know, basically had to apologize for the racist remarks because we are becoming more aware of that, especially um, even or even not especially even in the church framework. And even the way we speak about the LGBTQ community has kind of, you know, obviously evolved from President Kimball and become better in a way. We Again, sexism is always the last to the table. So we will see changes in those things. I think we will even see damage control in regards to the people of other faiths that he offended, but we won't we won't see an apology for any of the ways he taught about women and he taught about priesthood. You just won't see it. You don't really see it. invested in pretending that the sexism that isn't there. But there's still all this false flattery, you know, all, you have priesthood in this way and that way and whatever. And like, for the love of God, will you please stop asking for it? You know, um, but then there's but the, the pedestal, you know, the we are queens We're you know, we're this, we're that, the, the, you know, again, like we're better than the priesthood. Okay, the of, mothers. Yeah, it's just one of the most frustrating remarks for me that he made was about how we can just waltz into the temple. And I thought, is he trying to convince me that I'm the privileged party in this church? Because it's not working. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? That yes. it sounds like he's saying, yes. you know, why are you asking so many questions? You're the privileged one. You get to go yes. into the temple without priesthood. That absolutely is what it felt like was said to me. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's that's funny. That's I've not really internalized that one before. Seems like a form of gaslighting, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. He was very clear in his messaging. It was the same messaging he gave to <laughs> uh, uh, black people about the priesthood ban, that actually uh, they were the favored ones because they only got uh, discriminated against until 1978 and white people were discriminated against until 1820 nine so the math is strange question, on that but what oh, sorry i was just gonna say the real question we should be asking is that why do men need so much help that they have to have the priesthood that's right that's what he that's he ended his women's quote with about the priesthood which was what should be keeping us up at night is well the other question the question that we should be thinking about is what did women bring with them from the pre-mortal existence that makes it so they don't have to be ordained to the priesthood. That's what you'd be keeping us up at night. Right. Okay, I, just, I didn't know about that. So I, I didn't, <laughs> sorry, go ahead and say that, Nicole. I, I talked over just you. Just pedestalizing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which but is a form real. of imprisonment. It, it hurts. Yeah. I, the compliments, I feel like the things that wrinkle me the most now in, in messaging are, are these kind of compliments about us. And, you know, I don't know, just, just this praise for staying in the box. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Totally with you. We'll go to our final caller here and then we'll we'll end the calls. But uh, I don't have a name here. So caller, you're on Mormonism Live. What is your name? Hello? Is it me? Yep, your turn. Hello? Yeah. My name is Susan. Susan, and, good to um, have you on. I've never really spoken vocally. I... Um, didn't leave the church until I was in my 50s. I served a mission, went to BYU, taught in the MTC, and came from pioneer stock and completely, completely believed everything that I was ever taught and never felt like I would be of worth until I was married. And when I finally did have a child, it about killed me. But felt like I needed to have more because that's what I was taught. And it took me four years to get up the courage to have another child. And I always felt less than what my husband's callings were. I was married for 25 years. He was always quite a scholar in church history. I was not that interested in it. I always read all the Mormon things. And it was actually him that brought up to me, uh, finally, towards the end of our marriage about Joseph Smith having, uh, being a polygamist. And I never knew that. And once I started to have my eyes opened, like Nicole said, you can't unsee things. And, you know, Maven talked about, you know, wasting these years. But, you know, I felt like in my 50s, 
that I had wasted all of these years. And um, I listened to RFM. I've never missed an episode. And it has given me great comfort um, to learn the, these things and to feel validated in those. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. Yeah. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you for the call. Thank and you, Susan. So the only... The only people that I have shared my deepest feelings with, because everyone in my family thinks I left to sin. Um, the only people I share with are people that aren't members of the church, and and they praise me for my bravery. Mm. Amen. And that's thank yes. you. Amen. Yeah, right thank you. I have one more thought that oh, I want to share. Yeah. All right. um, that Susan just reminded me of. Um, it, it just that people in the church really do have a difficult time understanding this aspect. And I totally get the wanting to sin part um, because I mean, that, that's already what's been assumed about me as well. And I, I guess it's just another way where, where people don't get it. They think it's not about having a cup of coffee, you know, to leave the church. Again, this is my biggest pain point, my biggest source of regret and grief and everything is the, the the complete loss of myself for my whole life. And so it's just having that. That's the biggest thing. It's not about porn shoulders, tank tops, not going to church on Sunday. Like everyone wants to think like it's some it's some this when these things are too restrictive or these are things that you know that Maven and other people who leave the church want to do because they don't like being told they, they can't do those things. That's not it. The biggest thing the like for me the best thing is that I get to be my own self now and I get to, yeah. I, I get to like myself. I get to <laughs> follow what I want and, and I'm in charge of my body. That's been a really big thing. And it was something that I wasn't even quite aware of while I was still believing was how much my body did not feel like mine. If that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. it, it just yeah. decisions don't belong to me about it. So yeah, I they think, do now. I think honoring the bravery in every journey. I mean, I have three siblings, right? Who have left the church and I will defend their journeys <laughs> till the day I die. Even if I stay an active member of the church my whole life, I will defend those journeys till the day I die as brave, as admirable and as valid, just as valid as any of the choices I make inside the church. And that also, I think, for women especially, is an easy way to write them off when they leave as sinners, as lazy learners, as lax disciples, as rebellious, when really they are brave. They are in pain. They are finally honoring parts of them that never fit. And there are women in the church who stay for similar reasons. My siblings left because of their integrity and women I know who stay in the church, even with the hangups do it because that's the integrity that they have to stay. And I think part of what is so damaging is that we allow this to be so divisive when we leave or when we stay. And I think women, and again, one of the callers said she doesn't like generalizations. I don't either. But I think women feel that divisiveness acutely in their lives when they have to disappoint other people. Mm. Mm. I'll, I'll tell you guys in the comments, there was so much um, celebration for what you were saying, so much agreement with what you were saying, and so many people pointing to the two of you and the things you've said over the course of the evening and I just want to say great, great job to both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maven, for helping me be brave. <laughs> <laughs> it's my new favorite thing. <laughs> well, I guess this is supposed to be my show, but uh, I can't say anything that's <laughs> going to be any better than what our guests have said and what Maven has said. I was referring to you as a guest, but you're part of the team. And Nicole, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much for being brave enough to come on the show to Thank tell us you. your story. And um, I wish you nothing but the very best, whatever your journey is and wherever your path takes you. 
Thank you. And thank you to your listeners who have been so gracious to me in the comments. I appreciate them. Thank you. Good crowd. (laughs) Great episode, guys. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. We'll be here again next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. (laughs) Boom. Boom. Somebody got it. (laughs) 